Welcome everybody to um, this uh, Garden Court webinar on um, uh, uh, an update on the Court of Protection. Um, uh, I understand there is a sporting event um, starting uh, at the same time, which um, some of you will have um, maybe regretting uh, uh, missing, but in any event, we're cracking on. Um, so um, who you're going to hear from tonight is we're going to hear from Helen Curtis on capacity. I'm just going to interrupt straight away. I'm so sorry, Amanda. I'm just looking from what David said. Yeah. He's clicked. Yes, everyone can join. But uh, people have just been joining gradually. So I think they may have missed your opening comments. Um, just to let you know, I don't want anyone to miss what you're going to say. Oh, well, um, <laughs> that's true. That would be a shame. Um, I've got more lame jokes about sporting events, if anyone... <laughs> is interested but um well I'll, I'll just i'll just recap on that then if i may i'm just following the following the um the, the, the running order here so um uh so the, first of all we're going to hear from helen curtis on capacity um and then we're going to hear from um ollie percy on best interests after that we've got bethan who's going to give us um an update on practice and procedure in particular in dolls matters and then we've got the great honour of um, being able to hear from District Judge John Beckley with some perspectives from the bench, which I know that you're all going to be um, uh, interested to hear. So without further ado, um, I suggest we um, go over to Helen Curtis, who's going to talk to us about um, a capacity. Thanks very much, Amanda. Um, can you see my slides? No, not, not at the moment. Hang on. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome to this afternoon. I didn't think when we did this update in 2020 that we'd still be doing it through computers in 2021. But thank you very much for joining us, um, not least because of the competing event that Amanda's referred to. Um, I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes on capacity. There's uh, five short topics, but essentially the takeaway points are gonna be the importance of how capacity assessments are conducted, including by experts. Um, what is the relevant information that needs to be considered and Last but definitely not least is the importance of peace participation more increasingly now during remote hearings. Um, so straight away going on to deal with capacity to litigate. Um, this is a case that's decided by Mr Justice Mostyn and um, P was someone who uh, the reason it's important is that the proceedings started thinking that she had capacity to litigate, um, but didn't have capacity to make decisions about the HIV uh, retro antiretroviral treatment that she had resisted using. She was subject to a community treatment order, um, but refused to take the medication. Um, and in fact, Mr. Justice Mostyn said at the end of this case that he recognized, he said he'd taken his eye off the ball in really realising that he'd proceeded um, without really checking in on the capacity to litigate point. Um, and he reminds uh, himself and everyone of familiar ground um, that where P lacks subject matter capacity, then it's virtually impossible, his words, um, for that for P then to have capacity to litigate. And it's noteworthy that that's the same whether the litigant is represented or not. Um, how capacity assessments work in practice? Mr Justice Hayden, in this case uh, of TM, the trust were applying for an amputation uh, below the knee on both of TM's legs. Um, and this was uh, a situation where it was very unclear what TM's history was, very difficult to obtain. But essentially, the key point is that the precise pathology, there were different things that had happened in TM's life, and also a recent scan had showed that his white matter in his brain uh, had altered, and there was a number of different explanations for that. 
And ultimately, um, as Justice Hayden was very keen to emphasize that um, in finding that TM was unable to weigh and sift important factors, which was the functional test, um, that people ought not to over rely on identifying the precise pathology um, in order to establish the causal nexus. He found that that was a, um, just a, a wrong approach um, and not in keeping with the philosophy of the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, and in that case, uh, the presumption uh, in favour of capacity was rebutted by the uh, clinical evidence. Um, in the next case, we've got a uh, situation where Mrs Justice Lieben, uh, and this is, goes to the point about peace participation, um, this uh, middle-aged-ish um, lady was someone who could ha make um, decisions about treatment, um, about her uh, physical treatment, but lacked capacity, it was said, to make decisions about litigation or about her anorexia. And all parties were agreed about this position. Uh, and in fact, were agreed on the best interest point as well. So this is just as Leaven makes reference to the fact, well, if it's so straightforward, what, why, am I, um, why am I needing to write this judgment about it? And it, was, it looks as though it was because Mrs. Justice Leaven, on meeting with the R, found her to be very articulate and clear in her views and in the judge's view, insightful as to her condition. And all of that material suggested to, um, to the judge that, uh, in fact, ER may have capacity to make decisions about her anorexia and to litigate. Um, and because of that, Dr. Carhill, who's an expert in the field of anorexia, was asked to give oral evidence. Um, and in that situation, the litigation friend, who in this case was the official solicitor, uh, wanted to ask more questions around um, ER's, the, uh, the support that ER had had. Um, and bear with me a second, sorry. The screen was flashing, it distracted me, I do apologise. Um, uh, so they, um, I'm so sorry, um, the second opinion, um, which was provided by Dr. Carhill, uh, did go to whether or not um, ER, in fact, did lack capacity as the parties had agreed. Uh, the two principles that come out of this are Mrs. Justice Leaven reminding uh, everyone that the decision as to capacity uh, is a judgment for the court to make. And although, of course, the evidence of psychiatrists is going to be persuasive and very often determinative, it is a matter for the court. And it was with considerable reluctance, Mrs. Justice Leaven said, that she found in this case, accepting the evidence of the psychiatrists, that ER in fact did lack capacity, but it was quite a careful judgment and re-emphasizes that capacity and autonomy are so important, as the judge said, that the lack of it can't be assumed just for the sake of expediency. Looking at the case, the next case uh, of A, B and S, B, um, S, B was P and did not or was not keen on having a further capacity assessment on contact, but her mum did want her to have a further assessment on capacity for contact, really because of potential future risk uh, or risky contact with others uh, that was envisaged as a, a possibility in the future. And a previous judge had directed that a further capacity assessment be conducted. And uh, Her Honour Judge Anderson, uh, considering a number of things, including the fact that no party was asking for a best interest decision, decided, given the distress, distress and intrusion that a further capacity assessment would cause to, uh, to P, decided to discharge that previous direction against um, P's mum's wishes. Um, looking at the next case, this is an interesting case that Mr Justice Cobb considered, 
Um, KG in his 60s, uh, clinically, medically fit for discharge for about two years, um, but didn't want to leave the hospital. Um, and in this case, his two sons gave evidence, uh, AG and BG. And AG was, in fact, a mental health act nurse and really wanted to know, um, although agreeing with the overall outcome or direction of travel, I was very concerned as to how matters had got to this point of litigation and why, in fact, wasn't the money that was being spent on the litigation being spent on his dad. And this is a case where I think Mr Justice Cobb uh, engaged in some football banter um, with P uh, and made P made it very clear, able to converse fluently about football and cricket, but wanted to stay put, did not want to move to the specialist mental health residential home. So one question was how on earth was that going to be practically achieved if in fact KG did lack capacity to make this decision? Um, and in that case, again, the litigation friend wanted to test the capacity evidence, was unconvinced that the presumption had been displaced, um, thought perhaps there was a situation of fluctuating capacity, looked at the issue of lack of engagement, that KG hadn't properly been encouraged to engage uh, with the process, but ultimately uh, agreed uh, that he, there, there wasn't evidence uh, to suggest that he could in fact use and weigh the necessary and relevant um, information. Um, and in the next case, I'm just conscious of time, but just before I move on to the next case, just to, the, it's quoted there, uh, what Mr Justice Cobb found in terms of weighing up um, conducting that capacity assessment himself um, to support the court's conclusion. Um, the next case, again, uh, in practice, what happens uh, in cases, this one not, um, not perhaps uh, a usual uh, case for those practitioners in the court of protection, uh, a 19 year old young man who hadn't been at school for a couple of years, question was, did he lack capacity to consent to an assessment for his education and care plan? Um, and that, in that case, the judge looked at his approach, which was determine what the decisions were to be made, what was the relevant information in respect of each of those decisions, so guarding against a broad brush approach, and then determining whether or not the evidence was sufficient to support, in this case, an interim declaration that um, GP uh, lacked capacity in respect of those decisions. Uh, and the reason it was interim was because um, GP was only 19 and the court uh, wanted to leave open um, the, his capacity changing. Um, the judge identified what the relevant information was. And this case is interesting as well because the expert who um, was Dr. Rippon, and in terms of the test for capacity, uh, the judge was very keen to emphasize that the bar for capacity should not be raised. And so he ruled that it was irrelevant, uh, in effect, to place a burden on um, GP, that he ought to appreciate the sort of greater benefits of um, education that education would offer him. So a useful case to just re-emphasize that the test for capacity uh, has to be one which uh, is not um, made artificially high. That's my, my word, artificial, not used in the judgment. Um, the next case of ReZ, a, another amputation case, but in this case um, by Mr Justice Cohen, where a long-standing uh, capacitor's decision not, um, well, to consistently refuse amputation uh, that had been clinically indicated in 2016, 2018, um, again in 2019, uh, this lady 50 in her early 50s, type two diabetic. In fact, it transpired that um, before it was agreed that she didn't have capacity by the time of last November, earlier she'd had two toes amputated and it seems as though that was done without any court application and presumably without her consent. 
She was wholly opposed to um, amputation, but far in the final analysis, it was agreed that she had no capacity and that's what the court found and then went on to make um, the best interest decision to allow her wishes and feelings to prevail and to not impose um, treatment against her wishes. But interesting to see how the existence of the pre-existing capacitors decision influences or is, was taken into account in that sense uh, in the court. Um, just moving on to capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations. So it's no longer capacity to consent following the JB case, um, which um, this is a big note, and this will be after any football fixtures. Um, it's going to be heard on the 15th of July in the Supreme Court. Uh, hopefully it will be live streamed for those who are available to watch it. Uh, and before that is heard, there is the uh, these other cases which are raising issues which it's hoped the Supreme Court will be in a position to, to grapple with. Um, the first one is Reed D.Y. And this was a case where um, there was, again, not too high a test that should be imposed. Uh, this is Mrs. Justice Knowles. Um, and the expert evidence was that when DY was able to make a clear rational decision um, in relation to deciding to have sexual relations, that was easily done when she was settled and when she wasn't distressed. Um, but the suggestion was that when she became unsettled or if she was in an unfamiliar situation, then she would lose capacity. She was in a stable relationship. She couldn't conceive of being outside of that relationship. Uh, and Mrs. Justice Knowles resisted or rejected rather the local authorities' uh, application for a prospective declaration for some future time when um, DY might not be uh, in the settled relationship that she was in. Um, and made reference, of course, to JB and the way in which um, the decision of capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations uh, has been, has shifted. Um, and as I've said, is going to be looked at uh, again um, on the 15th of July. The Next case, again, dealing with um, capacity to engage in sexual or capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations. This case was, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to <coughs> a situation which is more common perhaps than people had realised. When one looks at this judgment of Mr Justice Hayden, there is a lot of information contained in there about um, those who lack capacity in other areas of their life, it may be um, property and affairs, but ultimately they have capacity to decide to engage in, uh, to have sexual relations. And C in this case did have capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations and to decide to have contact with a sex worker. Um, he lacked capacity to make the practical arrangements involved in identifying a suitably safe sex worker and working out the payment and things of that nature. So the court didn't uh, go on to look at a care plan that, uh, in a sort of TZ sense of how C would be supported to achieve that, um, but examined closely the interrelation with the Sexual Offences Act, Section 39, to consider where those who were involved in assisting C to make this arrangement, whether or not they were exposed to any liability. So um, a really interesting case, and given the connection um, with potential criminality, um, although Mr Justice Hayden is very clear that um, that, doesn't, uh, didn't um, apply in this case, um, looking at the interpretation of section 39. Um, it's thinking of JB and how the, that element of the criminal law may well be looked at. It'd be interesting to see whether or not this features um, on the 15th of July. Um, the 
Next case is in relation to two, well, in relation obviously to P, but there were two people uh, who lived in a care home and CI had um, uh, affection and feeling for AG, uh, who was a woman who wanted to reciprocate and felt that she was in love um, with CI. And this, this case is significant for the reason that the authority which came to the decision um, that she P did have capacity uh, to decide to have sex uh, and have contact with CI. Really, there was a hiatus in it because the earlier instructed expert uh, had found that her capacity was fluctuating in all respects, in all decisions. And uh, Mr. Justice Poole was really unhappy about that and, in fact, adjourned the case and ordered a fresh expert um, and said at the outset of this, uh, this decision that um, this uh, case effectively uh, demonstrates that a thorough assessment and a well-reasoned expert report on capacity can assist the resolution of difficult issues, saving time, resources and anguish. Um, and re-emphasise that the relevant information given to, in this case, AG, for each of the decisions had to be separately assessed with her ability to understand, retain, use and weigh that information um, separately considered. So in relation to each of the decisions, so definitely no broad brush approach is permitted. Um, I'm just looking at the time. I'm not going to go into the next case, um, which again um, looks at sexual P there, had capacity in many domains, um, but there was an interim declaration that, <clears throat> excuse me, AA lacked capacity specifically um, to engage in a particular sexual practice uh, or make decisions about uh, people he contacted online. Uh, and that was largely because he was advertising uh, and responding to adverts on the dark web. Um, just uh, very quickly in pregnancy cases, we've got an emergency out of hours application um, with P, agoraphobic, anxiety. Um, and this was an out of hours ap application before midnight, but in real extremists. Um, and Mr. Justice MacDonald set out uh, the way in which out-of-hours applications can be considered, and this was obviously one of them, and it was properly brought. Um, and by contrast, um, the case uh, just at the bottom here, Mrs. Justice Leaven, um, the University Hospital's Dorset case, uh, was horrified that the application was made so late um, and that apologies are simply not enough. Uh, and in the middle, we've got Mr. Justice Holman, um, who was making, uh, and this case has obviously come in for some controversial comment, um, made some decisions which uh, some people felt were, were premature, but in his view, uh, he needed to face up to a potential problem that um, P uh, would lack capacity to make the decision to leave the home in circumstances of the choice of home birth if she was needed to be admitted to hospital. So that case sort of sandwiched in between uh, what happens too quickly, too late, uh, and then this decision, perhaps some people thinking it was made um, prematurely. Uh, then finally, I'm just gonna to touch very briefly, um, last week uh, on the 24th and 25th of June, the Court of Appeal heard the appeal from the Divisional Court's decision. I've said, um, yeah, children and Gillick competence. Um, and then Mrs. Justice Levin again, slightly different decision on the puberty blockers case, um, but ultimately where is where is the power in the parent really is the is the question the parental right to consent on behalf of a child whether the child is guilt competent or not um, Mrs. Justice Leaven says effectively um, unless uh, the parents are seeking to override the decision of the child then the parental right to consent to treatment continues even when the child is guilt competent um, I hope I haven't gone over my 20 minutes. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. That's great, Helen. Thank you very much.
Um, and now we're going to go over to Ollie Percy, who's going to talk to us a bit about um, an update in the court's approach to best interests. Thanks. Take it away, Ollie. Thanks very much, Amanda and Helen. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. Um, I am going to be addressing best interests following on from Helen's presentation on capacity. I am going to be speaking primarily to the line of case law concerning COVID-19 vaccination and what the state of play is now, but I'll also briefly be touching upon interesting cases regarding permanent relocation out of jurisdiction, the removal of a relative from P's home, and keeping best interest assessments under review. So moving on to the COVID-19 line of case law and a rather novel issue of the vaccination programme and when vaccination will be in uh, P's best interests. The first case, and I just have flagged the timeline of these cases because they're quite important because the court's view um, develops during this period. The first case was in January 2020, fairly near the beginning of the vaccination rollout, the case of E, in which E was represented by our colleague, Gronje Mellon. And the most recent case from tier one is SS. All of those cases are tier one apart from CR, and all of the tier one cases are from Mr. Justice Hayden. So the first case of E uh, concerns an elderly woman in a care home uh, in January 2021. Uh, e, uh, when she had been capacious, had always been quite open for following public health guidance. He got vaccinated with the influenza vaccine and he is stated to have said whatever is best he would do. Um, her son, however, was less keen on the idea of vaccination. He was deeply suspicious of the speed in which the vaccine programme was being rolled out and was of the view that this was too much too fast. He did not object to vaccination in principle, but it was not right for his mother to have it now. Mr Justice Hayden distinguished between the views or, and personality of mother and son, and said that the concerns of the son did not reflect those of the mother when she had been capacious. Mr Justice Hayden looked through the risk factors, which are going to be common to many people in care homes um, at that time, and he identified the following as particular risk factors. Her age, she was in her 80s, she was living in a care home, an environment that was at risk of uh, COVID-19 transmission. Uh, the care home, that particular care home had live cases of COVID-19. Uh, e had type two diabetes, uh, which exacerbated the risk of COVID-19. And she had difficulty in complying with social distancing measures due to her dementia. At the time in January, we were experiencing a peak in COVID-19 transmission and deaths and the highest death rate per capita at the time. Studies showed that the vaccine was highly effective and would provide a significant amount of protection to E. As such, Mr Justice Hayden came to the view that this was not a delicately balanced risk matrix and that it was in E's best interest to receive the vaccine. The next case, also from Mr Justice Hayden, a month later broadly, we go January, February, March, April in four cases, that I'm going to speak to, concerned uh, a woman in her early 70s who had Korsakoff's syndrome, which is a brain injury induced by alcohol, and had been in this care home for the best part of 20 years. Uh, the application was by SD, V's daughter, who was based in the United States. SD joined the hearing uh, via remote video link and gave evidence. SD argued and forcefully argued that the vaccines um, were essentially untested and there was not sufficient evidence for um, anyone, but particularly someone in her mother's condition with, specific, uh, with her mother's specific conditions, including uh, bad organ damage as a result of alcohol abuse, uh, for her to get the vaccine safely was untested. 
Um, in evidence, she was pressed on exactly when it would be appropriate for her mother to get her to receive the vaccine. And the court came to the view, um, sorry, the SD came to the view that um, potentially in February 2023, but that seemed to be a date that had been plucked out of thin air and the court was um, concerned about the arbitrary nature of SD's reasoning in this regard. Um, um, th the next uh, bullet point is a typo. It should say V had the influenza vaccine when uh, she had been capacious. Um, what is quite interesting here and potentially a wider application outside of the COVID-19 vaccination context is that Mr. A, a care home worker for 20 years with, S, uh, with V, ha, um, that his view should be given particular weight. Um, that makes sense because he had known her for a long time. But the comment from Mr. Justice Hayden that care home workers fill a void that is made left by family members not having as much direct contact with a patient is a really interesting point and applicable in other settings apart from um, the issue of COVID-19 vaccination. Um, essentially, the primary concern for Mr. Justice Hayden in reaching this conclusion was, look, the evidence is um, peer reviewed, authentic, et cetera, um, for the vaccines being safe. The evidence that's been put forward by ST, SD seemed to lack uh, credibility overall uh, in these best interests for her to receive the vaccine. Now, we move on a month later, and this is the first case to consider COVID vaccination in the Northwest, and is a decision of uh, His Honour Judge Butler. And this case doesn't involve an elderly individual, but concerns a man with of 31 years of age, with learning disability, autism and epilepsy, who had moved into a care home mid-pandemic in January, on 31st of January 2021. Um, although, not elderly, the court came to the decision that um, the risks were sufficiently high enough to engage Article 2, and they gave weight to the prioritisation of COVID-19 vaccination. And because this individual was clinically vulnerable in terms of where he was placed in the COVID-19 vaccination categories, um, it was considered that it was in his best interests to um, received the vaccination and his article two was engaged. S. Um, CR's father held genuinely, um, had genuinely held objections that were not intrinsically logical according to the court, but they had no clinical evidence base and um, SR, CR's father's reasoning, was seen to be undermined by suggestions that of links between vaccination and autism more generally, which are discredited. Um, what is quite interesting and in the bottom two points of this presentation is that it applied to both doses of the vaccine, suggesting that His Honour Judge Butler didn't have the same temporal approach um, and wasn't as context sensitive to the level of um, COVID-19 transmission and death rate as uh, Mr Justice Hayden, as we will be illuminated further in the next case. Um, he said his reasoning applied to both doses, even though we know that's eight to 12 weeks apart. Um, and of further interest is it state, um, his honor Judge Butler stated that uh, he granted relief uh, requested by the CCG to provide the vaccine, but did not permit any use of force, um, did not fit authorize physical intervention in order to do so. This suggests that the balance is somewhat close, more finely balanced than it was in the earlier cases that um, I just addressed. So actually physical intervention would push the balance the other way. So the final case on COVID-19 vaccination is a case of SS and now we're into April, 2021. And we're back with Mr. Justice Hayden and it's an elderly individual in a care home uh, almost 28% of the residents of this care home had died of COVID-19. And this the particular interest in this case is what uh, weight should be given where there's ha where P has strongly and consistently expressed views uh, relating to vaccination and what weight they should be given and how you balance those considerations against the insidious risk of the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, and Mr. Justice Hayden is clear, it's not just about epidemiological 
considerations, but the broader welfare considerations. And he, um, he seemed to be particularly persuaded by evidence from the care home staff, which said that anyone administering a vaccine to SS would need to be a Kung Fu expert because of the level that he would resist vaccination. And he seemed particularly perturbed the idea that actually this would harm her relationship with her carers, the process of her being vaccinated and sedated and restrained while doing so. Um, he also looked again at the COVID transmission rate at this time and how effective the vaccine was and concluded actually the risk given that a large number had already been vaccinated in the home was substantially diminished um, contrary to his, the position in January of that year. Overall, he reached a conclusion quite different to the case of E that it was not in SS's best interest to be vaccinated. So I'm now briefly going to canter through, in the interest of time, I'll go very briefly, um, a few other cases not related to COVID-19. And this concerns um, relocation, permanent relocation of P outside of jurisdiction. And UR was um, 68 years old, born in Poland, and had been in a nursing home in Derby for six months, nine months. She had ex repeatedly expressed um, a desire to go back to Poland where she could be supported by her family, particularly her sister and niece. Um, ultimately, the court came to the conclusion that it was in Europe's best interest for her to do so. In coming to this conclusion, the court balanced um, reuniting her with her family, her consistently and clearly expressed wishes to go to Poland, that there were transitional mechanisms in place against concerns that she might not be eligible for social security from the state and that certain support medication might not be available there. What is particularly useful in this case is not the specific facts, but rather the guidance that Mr. Justice Hayden explicitly stated might be in the wide, of wider interest to people dealing with these cases. And I have pasted it uh, here. So that is paragraph 57. And in paragraph 58, there is an order which would be, he has provided, which would be readily adaptable in such a case. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go through those factors, but it is essentially a checklist that anyone working on these types of cases might want to go through um, because it's explicit guidance from Mr. Justice Hayden, Vice President of the Court of Protection. Um, so the next case is a local authority against TA, um, which is a judgment of Mr. Justice Cohen. And this concerned GA, and in a woman an 87 year old woman who lived with two of her children and had several other children that could not live with her. Um, TA um, had presented as GA's sole carer and proprietor of what he termed to be a care home, which was the court described as an entirely inappropriate description of a GA's home. And in fact, he purported to charge one million pounds a week for the care services that he provided. Um, TA was had been removed as a property and financial affairs LPA in December 2018 following an application for, from the Office of the Public Guardian and uh, several convictions for fraud and abuse of position in February 2016. Um, the court was considering in its own terms a draconian order of removing TA from this home. The issue was made slightly more straightforward for Mr Justice Cohen in that TA didn't actually have any proprietary the property rights in the home. Um, but the four, seven factors that he went through um, were all fairly compelling in stating that TA had to be removed now and it was proportionate to do so considering the countervailing interests of making TA homeless essentially um, and denying him from con of, of contact from his mother. So does factors that they went through with a risk of immediate harm to GA while um, we didn't know what was happening. He, he was, TA was essentially locking his mother away without supervision. GA was being denied the basic rights in that he wasn't being let outside, deprived of medical attention as nurses were not allowed to come in. There was no evidence before the court that TA was actually administering essential medication. Um, large part of her family was being cut off and interference with her Article 8 rights. And 
her intimate care needs were being provided by a man, despite her being a Muslim woman who had expressed strongly held views that he, that he, such intimate care needs needed to be attended to by a female. Um, and he was also keeping her under 24 hour surveillance. The local authority uh, offered him um, accommodation for 14 days to mitigate the immediate impact of uh, him being removed from the home. And it was a hundred yard cordon to stop him from coming close and observing the house from a distance. Um, the court expressed its hope that TA could be brought back into the fold at some point. And it was very alive to that this was an extremely draconian order, but proportionate in the extremities of these circumstances. And the final case I just briefly want to go through, and I'm very conscious of the limits on time that I have, is the case of Z against University Hospitals um, Plymouth NHS Trust. And what seems to be going on here is some people that, family members of RS who had essentially lost contact with him and put, seemed to be pursuing their own agenda about the right to life, uh, were interfering with proceedings and causing significant distress to both um, RS and his immediate family who were in contact. They employed fairly underhand um, approaches to gathering evidence in order to challenge the decision to remove a CANH. And for example, um, the birth family snuck in and recorded, secretly recorded RS in the hospital with a view of getting further <laughs> expert evidence uh, from uh, Dr. Policino um, to support their appeal. And all of the arguments that were put forward as a grand appeal were considered in inarguable and the court was very concerned by the approach that had been taken here by the birth family plainly wrong and a reminder of well-established case laws that the welfare principle applies to all decisions and uh, and removal of medical treatment can apply even when someone is not in a vegetative state. Um, what is perhaps interesting here for wider public, uh, for wider use in court of protection practice is when an earlier best interest determination will be revisited and essentially this was a paradigm case of when it would not be revisited um, because it was partially informed or ill-informed opinion. And it was a kind of case where um, unfounded, continued unfounded legal challenges were being used to disrupt lawful decisions at considerable distress. Um, CANH was being inserted and removed, inserted and removed to the fact, um, to his, to RS's wife in particular. Uh, so they're all the cases that I wanted to go through, and I will pass over to Bethan. Okay, all right. I hope my slides are ready. No, not quite. Going to... Ah, here we are. Thank you. I'm going to speak for the next 15 minutes on deprivation of liberty, recent developments in the last 12 months, and likewise, recent developments in practice and procedure. And, and then I'm going to briefly refer to obviously not the Court of Protection's jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of the High Court, the inherent jurisdiction for the protection of vulnerable adults, which often um, our cases um, tend to uh, extend into um, and is uh, related to uh, the kind of work that we do in the Court of Protection. So first of all, a couple of cases, and I think I'll speak primarily about the first one, on identifying a deprivation of liberty. I've set out the facts there, decision of Sir Mark Headley, and it's to do with a borderline case. Um, obviously, identifying whether a person's care arrangements amount to a deprivation of liberty is something that matters because if a person's arrangements for their care are a deprivation of liberty, then there have to be Article 5 safeguards in place, whether that's under dolls or whether that's an order from the court. And obviously, eventually, that will be under the liberty protection safeguards. And the issue arose here in relation to supported living, 
uh, and a person who was under a guardianship order. The arrangements were, as I've set them out there, the guardianship order with a condition of residence. The person was living in a flat in supported accommodation where there was support available day and night for her to take up as she pleased. She was free to leave the accommodation, but would be seen leaving by staff. And if she failed to return, the police would be called and staff had access to her flat. So there was a considerable amount of freedom there, not the 24 hour a day care package type situation, which is, of course, an obvious, generally an obvious uh, case of deprivation of liberty. So the court applied the acid test. And the uh, key issue was, was there here continuous supervision and control? under the acid test from Cheshire West. The case was borderline. It was noted that whilst she was free to leave the accommodation, she was always subject to state control requiring her to return. There was supervision in the sense that all her movements were known and noted. And while she could do as she pleased in the community, she was inevitably, there was inevitably some obligation to restrain or control those movements um, if there was a detriment to her welfare. And so just the decision was that there was a deprivation of liberty and there should be uh, authorization and review by the court. So just some points on this judgment. It's, it is, uh, I think, quite a useful judgment because it is typically clear, um, typically of um, um, Sir Mark Headley, uh, and uh, it's a useful one to have reference to if you're ever having to tackle a borderline case. The guardianship order in itself was not a reason to conclude that it was a deprivation of liberty. The court looked at not just what happens in practice, but what the true powers of control are. So that was a fairly key point in this, in this case. And then also asked itself, what would an ordinary member of the public think if they were living under these conditions? Again, another useful touch point uh, to add to um, one's uh, thought process when dealing with a borderline case. And then ultimately, if there's any doubt, to err on the side of caution in deciding that uh, uh, the care arrangements are a deprivation of liberty. And that's the policy that we get from Baroness Hale's uh, judgment in Cheshire West. So that's a one worth remembering, I think. Uh, and the case of um, London Borough of Havering, the next case, again, identifying a deprivation of liberty. This was a more obvious case. I'll just refer to it very briefly. It was the father of P who felt strongly that the arrangements were not a deprivation of liberty because his daughter, although she had 24 hour care at home, she was facilitated for her wishes to be realized uh, as far as possible. For example, if in the night she was up and active, she might be taken to an all night, all night McDonald's if that was what she wanted to do. Uh, the court um, looked at this obviously in the light of the acid test uh, and concluded that with this 24 hour care package, this was a case of continuous supervision and control and that uh, P was um, allowed to do things as she wished, but that was only because others were allowing her to do them. So the continuous supervision and control was, was present. Um, and I think those are the main comments on that case. Um, then staying with deprivation of liberty, the next case concerns the question of making a, um, an, an order authorising a deprivation of liberty on the basis of a possible loss of capacity in the future. Uh, so this is one of these prospective orders, uh, prospective in the sense that the loss of capacity uh, is not current, but it may occur in the future. And um, the court here was considering, and this is a similar sort of uh, situation as we've heard, I think we heard Helen talk of in relation to a young person, um, where looking at capacity in relation to a young person is um, very fact sensitive and their youth is obviously very much part of uh, what one uh, takes into account. Um, and here well, it was more a best interest issue where the um, youth of JK was relevant. She had lacked capacity in relation to care of her diabetes. Uh, but uh, after a very complex um, background as a, a young person, um, she had emerged at the age of 18 as having capacity um, most of the time in all areas, but she could lose capacity if she became very distressed. And the local authority wished to have in place a deprivation liberty order authorizing potentially if she lost capacity that she could be treated in an emergency um, for any kind of diabetic crisis and the court decided 
on a best interest analysis not to grant that order. And it was really because of the sort of trajectory for JK at that point. And she wanted to work with the local authority. She had a prospect of being able to develop her capacity and it would have been a real negative for her to have a deprivation of liberty order made with reference to her. Um, and um, so the comment I make there was the case was decided on best interest principles the, the doll order itself would have been a significant negative in her life. And then I make the point that the appropriate jurisdiction for making the order, had it been made, would in fact have been the High Court's uh, inherent jurisdiction. And that's because of the analysis that we get from a different case, the case of Guys and St. Thomas's, uh, judgment of Mr. Justice Hayden, explaining what's the statutory basis for making these prospective orders where people lose capacity uh, at a later date. Uh, it's section 15 of the Act, not section 16, but it doesn't work for deprivation of liberty because you can only make orders authorising deprivation of liberty in accordance with section 4A, which doesn't include on the basis of section 15. So you have to go to the inherent jurisdiction. So that's how that works. The next case is probably familiar to uh, most people who are uh, listening and watching DP against Hillingdon because it's altered the way in which we, we draft many orders. Um, this was a, an appeal from a, a case management decision under Section 21A, and it concerned whether the court should make interim declarations of incapacity um, in the course of case managing a uh, Section 21A challenge to a standard authorization. And the decision was that the court is reviewing the standard authorization. It doesn't need to make orders in order to um, hold the fort or, and to uh, approve the, the current arrangements because that's all looked after by the standard authorization itself. And so it would be wrong to be looking at making interim declarations on uh, incapacity or indeed any any orders of that kind during the case management process while the issues under Section 21A are being investigated. Um, and so what we get from this is that um, at point two in the held was that Section 48 is, is understood as essentially a threshold um, and it, where that threshold is met, it allows the court to make orders, but it should be stated in terms of a finding as opposed to declaratory terms. There is a power to make interim declarations and inter interim remedies, um, but Section 48 is essentially a threshold. Um, and um, as I say, that, that should be, um, strictly speaking, recorded as met as a finding rather than a declaration. And then Mr. Justice Hayden went on, Hayden went on to uh, make some a bitter obiter guidance in relation to Section 48 and how that should be exercised, referring back to some previous case law, um, which um, were decisions of, of, of his. Uh, where he emphasises the need for quite close scrutiny uh, as to the evidence of capacity in relation to um, interim orders um, and that there is a balance to be struck between the autonomy of uh, the individual and the need to make orders that will safeguard them. Um, and so the points arising from this judgment are that um, I think I'll go straight to number two here because of lack of time. Um, a further point arising from this judgment is that the judge contemplated that where capacity is an issue or there is a query about capacity in the context of the Section 21A proceedings, one of the avenues that's open to a court is to pose questions or to give um, uh, permission for the parties to pose questions to the doctor who conducted the the, um, the mental capacity assessment under Schedule A1 in the context of the dolls, um, or to ask um, that doctor to revisit their assessment. So that's an, another uh, string to one's bow if there is a capacity issue in Section 21A proceedings, which may or may not be useful um, as an approach in any given case. I've got five minutes left, so I'll be very quick. This case is and just very briefly a decision about when defects in a standard authorization will invalidate it and in this case the standard authorization had um, uh, 
correctly identified the person um, whom it related to, um, but in 19 instances in the narrative had referred to the relevant person as Ms. Hull, um, whereas uh, the person concerned um, was not called Ms. Hull. Um, and evidently there'd been a sort of cut and paste um, process involved in putting together the text in the standard authorization. Obviously the purpose of the standard authorization is, is to sign off the other assessments that um, are authorizing the person's deprivation of liberty. And on an appeal before a senior judge Hilda, she found that because there was evidence in a witness statement from the local authority that they had in fact carried out the, uh, the scrutiny um, of the underlying assessments and the underlying assessments were not flawed, uh, that this was essentially um, a typographical error or the district a deputy district judge had was entitled to find that it was it wasn't an error of substance so the court will distinguish between an error of substance and an error of form and the court referred back to a very important decision for fundamentals on deprivation of liberty uh, the case of london borough of hillingdon against neary when looking at this point which was a case where the standard authorizations uh, were in place in relation to Stephen Neary, and yet the uh, deprivation of liberty was nevertheless unlawful in that case, in contrast to the case of YC, because the underlying assessments were very flawed, um, hadn't looked at the relevant uh, information, etc. Uh, so that was a case of uh, where there were problems of substance of, of uh, great significance in that case, and that's a very important um, case for to bear in mind for fundamental principles. And briefly on damages for deprivation of liberty, the case of uh, Mrs. Emile, uh, this is a case of uh, District Judge Beckley, who of course is uh, with us uh, this evening, and an award was made to her for deprivation of liberty, which was unlawful, unauthorised, and the award was £143,000 over many years of uh, unauthorised deprivation of liberty. And there was a set off of care home fees that were unpaid, um, reducing that amount. Um, she pursued her claim as a counterclaim against a, a claim for unpaid care home fees. Um, and um, the uh, award was appealed and was upheld as being uh, not manifestly excessive. Um, the local authority had made an error. Um, in that it had uh, not assessed her capacity when it placed her initially right back in 2008 in a care home and uh, her options had not been adequately investigated as they should have been and had they been then she may have uh, spent uh, those years of her life in different circumstances so this was not a case for nominal damages um, and as I say that that award was upheld. Uh, then a few points very quickly on practice and procedure. Um, I'm going to flag these two next cases. One of them is a Court of Appeal case. The first one in front of Mr Justice Cobb, it's to do with a closed process where a, a person applies to join proceedings as a party and the, local, and the court wants to um, keep information um, in the proceedings confidential from that person in order to protect, to protect the interests of P. And uh, Mr Justice Cobb sets out the principles of how that can be done in a fair way in the, uh, case, the case of KK. And then in the Court of Appeal, in RP, the court deals with a situation where a person has been a party of the proceedings and the court to wants to consider whether they should be discharged, um, uh, whether it's appropriate for the person to be discharged, and what is a fair process in doing so. And um, in that case, um, Mr Justice Hayden, who was the first instance judge, had um, in um, implemented a very kind of uh, abrupt process without notice um, uh, of discharging a the mother who'd been a party to the proceedings for quite some time and that process was um, unnecessarily draconian it was held and a, a, a more step-by-step -step process could have been engaged and the court looks at that in some detail so it's an important uh, case on process on fair process and one of the points I think is useful to look at is uh, point two um, 
useful coming out of uh, this judgment. Point two on this list of points is uh, what are the principles when the court is making case management decisions to discharge a party? Um, that sort of decision, a case management decision, is not a best interest decision. It's not a decision under Section 1.5. But P's best interests are relevant because if you look at the uh, overriding objective, it requires that, which is, of course, in the Court of Protection rules, it requires that the interests and the position of P are considered. And so P's position um, has a central uh, is central in relation to those uh, case management um, decisions, even though it's not a best interest decision as such. And the court also usefully comments here on the immense power that the Court of Protection has under Court of Protection Rule 3 to disregard um, any rule um, and uh, how it should um, approach using that particular rule. Um, I'm just going to skin over this one. This is basically an injunction which ought not to have been granted to compel a provider of accommodation to uh, or not to have been applied for um, seeking to compel a provider of accommodation to provide it because um, the power to grant injunctions does not go that far. Um, two very brief um, mentions there of um, two procedural points, reopening best interest proceedings, sentencing in the Court of Protection, immediate sentence for 12 months in that instance for forging a court order. And I'm going to skim over that one and I'm going to just end now with two or, two or three quick points. Firstly, on the inherent jurisdiction um, for the protection of vulnerable adults. I've put some background in this slide and the talk of um, Sir James Mumby, um, which is um, really trying to define where this jurisdiction is going. Um, that's a very, interest, very interesting, refers to lots of the uh, key cases. Um, two recent cases which really highlight the problems um, that there are with um, the lack of clarity as to the parameters of the jurisdiction. Um, and uh, that's uh, Mazar is one of them in the Court of Appeal. And then just very finally, um, a few um, uh, aspects of legislation, guidance and policy, etc. The rapid consultation on uh, remote and hybrid he hearings, which um, you may have participated in. We are waiting for the publication of the new Code of Practice to the MCA, which will uh, be put out for public consultation and also the draft regulations for the liberty protection safeguards which are uh, due to be implemented or the target date is April 2022 and I've mentioned uh, a couple of other um, of other things there which um, I think I don't need to say any more to so I will end there thank you very much and this is um, a question directed possibly at um, Ollie who was thinking about um, the use of restraint as a factor in best interest decisions. Um, Emma's wondering that um, uh, it might uh, impact attendance at day centres and local authorities might refuse um, young people if not vaccinated. And maybe there ought to be a separate um, best interest decision relating to um, vaccination. I'm wondering, Ollie, if you'd like to have a go at answering that one. What are your thoughts, asked Emma? Yeah, good question. Um, very good question. And I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, there are lots of countervailing considerations that would need to be weighed up in dealing with this. Um, I think one of the sort of emerging sort of themes of the COVID case law was about reduced risk overall once there's a high vaccination rate. And they didn't use the term herd immunity, but if everyone, the risks become substantially lower when the higher everyone else is, the more people that are vaccinated. So one person not being vaccinated might be, will be considered a relatively low risk to insert into an environment such as a day centre, etc. So that's one consideration. Um, General uh, external factors, you, you made reference earlier to Hayden J. Um, taking the sort of general risk factors into account. Yeah. What about the rest of the presenters? Does anybody else have any thoughts about um, uh, a, 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 about how um, decisions in respect of attendance um, at uh, possibly confined indoor spaces where um, transmission might be a risk? 
Oh, just one further point is um, the risk of um, a discrimination on the basis of uh, disability under the Equality Act for refusing someone to enter um, a day centre, etc. Um, because um, indirect discrimination that would be justified. And then the factors that we just discussed would go to the sort of proportionality and the sort of justification analysis. Um, uh, yeah, I think it would be very case sensitive. Absolutely. Anybody, else, anything to add at um, 27 minutes past six? No, no, nothing useful to add. I think case sensitive is, is, definitely, is definitely the word. That's what we've seen in the case law so far. And as, as generally in best interest decision making. That's right. I mean, it's often the triangulation of different interests, isn't it? And, um, uh, and risk factors that the court has to take into account. But obviously, if there were a blanket policy decision by, taken by um, a, a local authority or a, a day centre provider, um, that would obviously be um, at risk of being uh, targeted as, a, a, as, a, as discriminatory. Right, so um, it's 28 minutes past six, and though that's the end of the questions that we had posted. It only leaves it to me to say, um, well done, everyone. I myself was absolutely gripped by the presentations. There were lots to think about, lots going on, lots of work had gone into it, and my very great thanks, and on behalf of everybody attending, um, thanks and thank you for everyone for um, showing up uh, when there was uh, the alternative attractions of a certain sporting event. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>